John Kasich, thank you so, so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you. Thank you, B. Congratulations thank you. to you being the president. Thank you. Um, so I want to start off with, I suppose, what's your most prominent role at the moment, which is as one of the only anti-Trump Republicans to have remained firmly opposed to the president for the last few years. I guess I want to start off with asking you about why you've stuck to your opposition to Trump and why you think so many other Republicans haven't. Well, B, the reason why I didn't support him the last time is I was uh, very afraid that he was going to be a divider that he was um, uh, just really going to play on people's concerns and fears. And I happen to believe you should acknowledge them, uh, but you don't have to drill down and divide people and, and also give them false hope. So in 2016, I did not endorse Donald Trump. And <clears throat> more strange than that, we had the Republican convention in my state, which I helped the state to get, and I never went. And then for the last four years, so the first couple of years, I was hoping he would change and that I would be able to support him. Well, he did not. And um, so the Democrats asked me if I would speak at their convention. And I thought about it and I said, sure. So I wrote a speech, delivered it, um, didn't share it with anybody, just sent it over to them. They played it at the convention. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I've been kind of you know, speaking out, but also have a job as a commentator. So I, I want to have some sort of uh, objectivity. And uh, Biden has won, Trump is gone, and now we, uh, we move on. But the party, my political party has always been my vehicle, uh, be and never my master. I mean, I've been in politics, actually started in the legislature, the state legislature, and then nine terms in the Congress. And my view has always been, you look at a problem, you try to fix it. You don't, regard, you don't have to check in with the Republican party or the Democratic party or whatever. You try to devise a solution. You work with other people, regardless of what party they're in, and you offer solutions to problems. I see no other reason to be in politics other than to do things like that. Why then do you think so few other prominent Republicans have been willing to speak out against Trump over the past four years? Well, I think they've been very concerned about making Trump voters mad and perhaps losing their election, you know, so... Uh, you know, they want to be, they want to keep in power and, and, uh, you know, they grumble privately, I'm told, uh, but publicly, you know, they, they stay with them because they fear uh, the Trump voters coming and getting them. But that's like, uh, you know, to me, that's like inheriting the earth, but losing your soul. So I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I don't know why they, more of them did not break out and just say, look, I'm going to argue against this. If I lose, I lose. And there have been some that have lost as a result of it, Mark Sanford being one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you asked him today how he feels, he'd probably say he was proud of what he did. So um, it's a disappointment for many of us that the party uh, that the party just was in lockstep, that they didn't object to many of the things that he did. And secondly, you know, where are their ideas? I mean, where are the ideas on health care? Where are the ideas on the environment? Where are the ideas on race? Where are the ideas on the wealth gap? You don't see many. And that concerns me about the future of, uh, of the party, which I remain a member of. Why do you think, especially now then, as we, we see Republicans like Mitch McConnell, like Lindsey Graham, continuing to refuse to take a stance against Trump, especially when, you know, Fox, for instance, is doing so for the first time? Yeah, well... B, I actually talked to some people about that this morning because it, it kind of remains, it's not a mystery. They're really worried about having the Trump people leave them. It's politics. Uh, I think they all understand that through court fights, recounts or whatever, the results aren't going to change, but they can hang in there as long as they can so they don't make the Trump voters angry and, and they can have electoral success. That's what I think is going on. But I think it creates... Uh, B, I think it, uh, it just sets such a bad tone for going forward. And I think the people in the country, even though they're in their silos or whatever, I, I think at the end they realize that there's got to be some sort of cooperation if you're going to deal with major issues like health care, Social Security, the growing debt. Um, but right now they're still locked into, uh, into our silos. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. For those Republicans then, or excuse me, as we see such prominent Republicans continuing to refuse to concede or support President Trump in his refusal to concede, in your mind, as somebody with so much experience of the top of American politics and the GOP, 
What does the timeline between now and Inauguration Day look like? Will we see Republicans continuing to back Trump? Will we see people gradually peeling off? I think what you'll see is um, <clears throat> they'll finish the, the vote counting, those places where there are still votes to be counted, provisional ballots. Those are ballots that were set aside for one reason or another, and those will be completed. And then in some states like Georgia, there'll be a, a, be a recount. And recounts usually don't change much. They're usually just a few votes here and there. And there'll probably be some court challenges along the way. And at some point, uh, these Republicans are going to have to say, yeah, I guess we've exhausted everything we have, so let's get on with it. But in the meantime, you know, it just creates a, a very bad taste in, in people's uh, mouth about the ability for the two parties to at least make some kind of progress, even if it's moderate steps. It, it just, it's, you know, it's, it, it has the potential to kind of poison the well and prevent the kind of things that I think that most Americans, most Americans would want to see happen. We'll go on to what you expect from a Biden presidency in a minute, but I just want to go backwards for one second and <clears throat> how we got to this position, how Biden managed to win the election. You've mentioned um, the, your role in this election, and you've also mentioned in various other media um, that you believe the Democrats have to make clear to the far left that they almost cost him the election, for instance. But when you see the grassroots activism that helps Democrats win places like Detroit, for instance, why do you think that it's the progressives that are to blame for this elect for, um, excuse me, for any near loss in this election? Well, I just have to listen to the Democrats who actually hold office. I read an interview by Connor Lamb, the moderate Democrat who holds a Republican seat outside the city of Pittsburgh. And <clears throat> when you when you are talking about things like even implying defunding police, when people get a sense that, well, maybe there's a drift towards socialism, capitalism doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't think that's what uh, is gonna get you uh, votes because I think the public, American public is basically center right and center left. Uh, I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying that those, I'm not gonna blame them for this election. What I'm saying is <clears throat> when, <clears throat> when people hear this, excuse me, <clears throat> when people hear this, I've been on too many Zooms today. That's when people right. hear this, B, they hear that it, it frightens them. It scares them. And when you do an analysis of the non-urban areas, when you look at the abandoned factory towns and things like that, you see where Trump has had victories where Democrats, you know, couldn't even hope, uh, where Democrats were sort of a shoe in and Republicans couldn't hope to get a vote. But if you frighten those people, with talk of defunding police, because Americans support the police overwhelmingly. Uh, they believe that capitalism is good. Many of these people believe that when they play a football game, people shouldn't be kneeling when they play the national anthem. There's a cultural part of this thing, and also a concern about the issues that could move us way to the left, because again, America is mostly center right or center left. The Republicans have, you know, also have very serious problems with the fact that they, have, they don't have any ideas that they put forward. There's a big debate on health care, and we never saw a health care plan. Uh, there were many people concerned about the environment. They never saw a, a, any plan on the environment. So uh, what I would say is that uh, when you look at Detroit, when you look at Philadelphia, I think an awful lot of credit actually has to go to Barack Obama, uh, who was very, very effective in, in uh, helping turn out. Um, but if you listen to the Democrats talk about their concern, this lady from Virginia, who's in sort of a, you know, a swing district, she, she was on a call the other day with a bunch of the Democrats uh, telling them that they almost cost her the election because of this talk about, uh, you know, drift towards socialism or defunding the police. And there's other issues as well, you know, how they handled the, uh, the violence in the cities that went along with the protests. These are things that, that upset people. And I think that the, the left, God bless them for their ideas, their idea people, I give them credit for that. But ideas that are way out of the mainstream, in my opinion, are not something that have, people don't want all that change, particularly with the pandemic. I mean, you're in lockdown, you know, there's great nervousness here, people have a lot of fear, and all of a sudden, we're going to have all this sweeping change. People aren't ready for it. Now, B, let me also tell you that I'm an idea person, and I want to get as much done as I possibly can. And I fought on many big issues, balancing the federal budget, expanding Medicaid in Ohio. I'm a person that, that loves ideas and I respect these people that have ideas. 
And I just would hope that the Republican Party would move from basically a cult of personality involving Donald Trump to a whole set of issues because they're not going to win long term or build this party based on a cult of personality. So it's it's not a simple thing that I'm saying, but clearly when you are presenting ideas that shake people up who naturally could vote for you, you got to look at it. I think that's a really interesting point. I wonder why you think there's such a lack of ideas at the moment in the ideological center. Why is all of the movement that we're seeing coming from the far left and the far right? But I think Biden, Biden won the primary and he was moderate. He's center left. And so, you know, he didn't go along with Medicare for all. He didn't go along with the New Green Deal or any of those things. He hung in there and stuck it out. And, um, and as a result, he was the nominee. And I always felt that in order to beat Donald Trump, you had to be more centrist. Now, you know, the real question be is how can you be centrist and interesting? And you have a lot of smart people at Oxford. If you can explain to me how to be center and interesting, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. I want to hear how to do it. But, you know, the, the more, the more I say radical ideas are the ones that sort of capture your attention, the media and Twitter, and you know, all that it's, nobody is saying, oh, well, the woman crossed the street and the Boy Scout helped her. Nobody's looking at that. But when they say, oh, but the Boy Scout was crossing the street and uh, or the woman was crossing the street, and the Boy Scout took her ha- handbag. We're on Twitter saying, can you believe that? So there is a there is a necessary challenge for those who are more centrist to figure out how to present their ideas in a very interesting way. And I think it's very possible to do the issue of the environment, the issue of race, the, the wealth gap, at least you got to start talking about it and come up with answers. And, and I think that in that way, the way you talk about it and the issues you pick can, can make you extremely interesting and someone that people want to listen to. How will you as a relatively centrist Republican then attempt to ensure that the kind of ideas and policies that come out of a Biden presidency are the kind of things that you want to see? Well, first of all, I'm a conservative. I'm not really a moderate. I'm a conservative, but I also think that sometimes as you approach difficult problems, you can't just be against government. You can't just say, no, I don't like that idea. It's, 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 it puts you in a straitjacket ideologically. But my basic approach is government is a last resort, not as a first resort. And if you find it in the yellow pages many times, you don't need to have the government do it. Uh, but government has a role to play. Um, in terms of what I intend to do, um, you know, I have a I have a voice on television, I'm probably going to be pretty soon having a podcast, uh, you know, whether it's uh, my social media activities. Uh, if we start to see Joe Biden go hard left, I'd be very critical of him the same way I talk about Republicans or the same way I talk about the Democratic left. You know, and B, I don't want to <laughs> exaggerate my importance. I'm just one voice out here. But at this point in time, I seem to be able to having a voice that might be somewhat amplified, where I, I can be heard. Now, I think the situation is setting up in Washington where the Republicans are likely to control the Senate. And, uh, and with Joe Biden, if, if he comes with a lot of very radical ideas or extreme ideas, the, the Republicans are going to say, see, we told you who he was. And, but if he comes with more moderate ideas, and, and the Republicans block it, then I think Joe, Joe Biden's in a position to call them obstructionists. So it's going to be a dance that has to be walked here. Uh, and frankly, I think that the possibility exists for being able to achieve some things in, uh, in more, probably more moderate steps. And again, I've got to tell you, my nature is let's go, let's, let's hit for the fences. You know, that's, but I also have to know what you need to do uh, in order to get things done. And I was involved in balancing the federal budget. I, I, Ohio went from, uh, you know, in the basement to the penthouse because of the policies we put in place. And a number of them were, were very significant and, uh, and dramatic. For example, private, privatizing economic development in our state, providing an earned income tax credit for the working poor that had never been done before. There are a lot of things that, that I did that were, that were not doctrinaire, that were different, that were out of the box. So, I can resonate with that, but I also know, I think, what will, what will happen. One other thing, B, early on in my administration, I offered a pretty dramatic change in the way that police and fire treated with pensions and health care and, uh, and whether public employees should have the right to strike and binding arbitration and all that. So we passed that through the legislature. 
and we had a ballot issue that repealed all that. And I got hammered. I lost like 80, 20. You know what? It was a bridge too far. And so uh, I learned from that and learned about the way in which you want to accomplish something, because at the end, you want to look back and say, what did I accomplish? Not that I was a good Republican or a good Democrat or a good member of labor or a great Tory. Who cares if you don't move things and improve, bring great improvement uh, to, the, to your country? But when you look at the kind of partisan gridlock that we've seen in the past few years in the Senate, especially, and then you look at the behavior of people like Mitch McConnell this week, what makes you think that there really is any hope for a country in which you have a Democratic president and a likely Republican Senate to get anything done? Well, B, because if Joe Biden brings reasonable things, you know, a reasonable uh, a set of solutions to address the environment, and I'm going to actually, when we finish this, I'll be talking to John Kerry because he and I, he really formed it, and I'm working with him on World War Zero, designed to eliminate carbon by 2050. There are very reasonable things that can be offered. I mean, you have Jim Baker and George Schultz, former Republican secretaries of states who have come up with ideas on uh, on taxing carbon. And, and there are reasonable things that we can do. So if Biden presents them and the Republicans say no way, then I think they begin to look like obstructionists. And I don't think that serves their interests. I think to be a party that just says no to everything is not a party that's going to make it. So I think there is incentives for Mitch McConnell to, uh, to be able to work with Joe Biden on things where they can find some common ground. In practical it may not happen, B. It may be, it may be just like when McConnell basically said about Obama's second term, you know, he's, he's not going to get anything. Mm -hmm. But I, I just don't think that works over time. In practical terms, then, how do you see the GOP moving beyond Trump or Trumpism? Don't know. I don't, there's going to be a, probably a tug of war inside the Republican Party. Those, and look, we have a, a, a significant change in the demographics with more and more young people, you know, uh, coming on, on of age here, where both Gen X, Gen Z, they're going to be a majority. Uh, they're, I'm not a majority, but they're going to have, they're going to have more political power uh, than the baby boomer generation. And then you're going to have a significant demographic change in America with more and more minorities becoming a majority of, of the country. So it, <laughs> you have these young people coming on and right now, if all you want to do is yell and scream at people or have a cultural war, uh, you know, you're 20 years old. My daughters are 20. They didn't vote for Trump. I, I think young people are yearning for ideas and cooperation and some degree of civility. So the party has to figure out what their agenda is going to be. And some people will say, oh, no, no, no we're just double down on, on Trump's rhetoric. But I got to tell you, I don't know of any other politician that can do what Donald Trump has done and get away with it. If I talked to, 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 about people the way that he did, they'd have run me out of here on a rail. So I don't think that's a sustainable model myself. But, uh, you know, I'll have my say, they'll have their say, and we'll see where it goes. Great. Thank you so much. With that, we'll move to audience questions because we've got quite a lot coming through. The first is from um, Jacob Murphy at Maudlin, who says, how can the GOP regain initiative to provide new solutions to problems while regaining values such as individual liberty, small efficient government and open market? Oh, yeah. Excuse me. Well, I, I think that's actually pretty easy, but there's something about conservatives where conservatives have it in their nature. And I'll tell you a little story, have it in their nature to sort of be again. And they think they do better by being against. In, in 1993, uh, Bill Clinton was trying to raise taxes. I was the senior member of the Republican uh, budget effort, and I had an alternative that spelled out all the things that, the, that we needed to do in regard to fiscal policy. I mean, I almost wasn't able to offer that because Republicans were saying, no reason to ever offer anything. We'll just criticize them and we'll win. And there's some truth to that. But how boring. What is the purpose then? Well, I finally won that battle and was able to offer what, what I wanted. And it ended up in 1994, uh, Republicans won a majority and the new members of the Republican freshman class uh, gave, made me an honorary freshman because they said that these ideas that we had put out there energized them and made them more effective as a candidate. Um, I, I think there's a lot of great, I think there's a lot of free market solutions on the environment. I think there's free market solutions in healthcare. For example, 
uh, give, holding, letting companies uh, carry risk and paying them a certain amount of money to keep us healthy rather than treating us when we're poor. Thinking about what we do about, uh, about police and community. There are ways in which you can bring police and community together and, and make progress. But if you're gonna be afraid that your ideas are gonna be criticized and therefore you offer none, I don't, I, first of all, I don't know why you'd be in office. And secondly, I don't think that works over time. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Miles at St. Edmund Hall, who said, asks if you can discuss um, how the president, excuse me, how President-elect Biden can attempt to return integrity, compassion, and decency to the White House in order to bridge the divides that exist in America. You know, the bully pulpit of the White House is unbelievable. And Joe Biden's nature is to be a consensus builder. That's, that's who he is. That's what he's done all of his lifetime. And you know, it's not just going to be using the bully pulpit with words, it's also going to involve deeds. And, you know, this is a matter of, for example, a part of the problem that Democrats have is relating to people who live in communities that used to be industrialized and they've lost their businesses. Well, you got to think about what you want to do about that and let them know they are not forgotten and let them know through job training or whatever that there is an opportunity to have hope again. Uh, for people who live in, in the uh, in the suburbs, you know, or, or I'm sorry, in the really outside the non-urban areas, you know, I, I think it's I think people they don't mind political correctness, but they they mind extreme political correctness. And so I think that there are things that Biden can say about the culture that will make sense. Um, but he has to understand their challenges and their problems out there. And, and you know, for example, when, when Hillary Clinton, and God, you know, God bless her, but when she called these folks in the, in the, in the very small towns across America, the deplorables, that had, a, that had a very big impact. You've got to show respect. And there are many things you can do in these areas, including how about broadband, so that everybody, no matter where you live, have access uh, uh, to the internet. That can help with jobs in an area where look, we're Zooming today, right? Where we can actually do our work uh, from, from a distance. Their schools are in trouble. Maybe perhaps there are some things it can do to help them rebuild their schools. The issue of opiates. There are many things that can be done to deal with the issue of opiates. Or as I talked about the earned income tax credit to give the working folks who are struggling, who are worried about what's gonna happen tomorrow, an opportunity to see some light because some people be in our country today have lost the notion that tomorrow can be a better day than today. That's an essential American principle. I think it's what unites uh, us with you is the notion that this, that this free market system, uh, if handled appropriately with a value-based um, foundation, that tomorrow can be better for us and can be better uh, for our children. A little early to talk about you for children at, at 20, but at some point it's likely to happen and you wanna have hope that your kids will do better than you've done. And in some parts of our country, that feeling is gone and it needs to be restored. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Sean at Wadham, who says, how do you reconcile your view that most Americans lie economically in the center ground with the success of progressive ballot initiatives in swing and red states? Um, he cites, for instance, the 61% vote for $15 minimum wage in Florida. But I think you can also look at Fox News's exit polls after the election showing views on health care, for instance. How do you reconcile those two views? Well, look, I, I mean, if you take a look at the election results, and I was just looking here at the Wall Street Journal about the, about the suburbs. I mean, Donald or uh, Joe Biden won the suburbs uh, because, you know, he talked about civility. He talked about, you know, health care, those kinds of things. But I have to also tell you that in those suburbs, we saw some movement towards Trump when they started to get concerned about things like defunding the police. Um, you know, back when we had the protests that went left the riots, I was telling or, you know, basically pleading with the Democrats to get Joe Biden to say something about condemning the violence. He did, but it was later rather than sooner. And those kind of issues, and I'll give you another one that worries people, not just in the suburbs, but just outside the suburbs, the exurbs, is they're worried about, about the economy. They're worried, you know, some of them are just barely hanging on to their jobs. And, and then in the middle of COVID, 
the middle of this pandemic, there's a lot of fear. And now what I'm going to do is introduce all these other ideas. I, I believe that what happened is that the Democrats were able to use their organization to drive a bigger turnout in the urban areas. Uh, I think, again, back to Barack Obama, he went to Philadelphia. I don't know, he was basically living in Philadelphia because he was trying to get the votes, of the African-American votes out in that city. The same thing happened in Georgia. The same thing uh, happened in Michigan. And I don't think they were driven there by the, by the far left. Now, the, they probably uh, uh, were able to motivate some people. Uh, but I have to also say, had, they, had Biden been firmer on the police, had Biden been, had been more firm on, we're not going to socialism and spoken out really strongly on it, I think he would have done better. Um, but I think the question was predominantly about economic issues, specifically affordable health care, in that, of course, we can talk about ideas that you believe put moderate voters off. But the question was about whether why you believe that most people lie economically in the center when it seems that more radical economic plans seem to have been more popular and more successful. Surely there's room but for- where, where is that? I don't know where that, where that I is. I think the example was regarding increasing minimum wage in Florida. I don't, but think I, that's, I don't think that's a radical plan. I think saying that we ought to have some increase in the minimum wage is, is a good issue. I don't see that as, is, uh, but saying that we can, we can take on you know, trillions of, of dollars of debt and the new green deal. And uh, that's, that scares people. And when you, it's Medicare for all, you know, look down in South Florida, where a lot of the people in South Florida gave Trump enormous wins in Dade, you know, or great, great progress in Dade County, because they were worried about socialism. You know, so I don't, I don't, I think that, um, again, where, where I think most Americans are, they want to believe, here's what they want to believe if they play by the rules, that they'll be rewarded. They want to believe if they play by the rules that they'll do fine, but their kids will do better. And I think there is a growing concern in America that that doesn't hold true. And so there has to be a way to speak to them and to show them, no, that's simply not true. And again, back to what I suggested, earned income tax credit, improving their schools, uh, making sure that, that, that agriculture does well and we don't create these tariffs that, that hurt the farmers. Um, you know, infrastructure, so everybody can have internet uh, accessibility. Those kinds of things would make a big difference out there um, and giving them, you know, giving them a sense that tomorrow can be better. All right, then. Looking towards that political future, the next question is from Tom at St. Evan Hall, who says, how can the Republicans regain the trust of young centrist or moderate conservatives in the U.S. after being driven away by the divisive rhetoric of the Trump administration? Look, I, I think that almost all young people, I, I don't want to say, a lot of young people, the overwhelming majority are concerned about the environment. And when you say that, well, we don't think it's a problem, that this, is, this means nothing. Uh, when you say, uh, you know, when you don't begin to address uh, some of the violence that we've seen, I don't mean the, the when you see, the, um, when you see the, the racial divisions in the country, uh, and I'm talking about the the things that people have been, you know, the, the uh, George Floyd and those kinds of things, and the need to have legitimate community and police reform, uh, you know, that that needs. If you don't have anything about that, or if you don't have, you can't talk about the wealth gap, or you talk about what I'm talking about with hope and civility. I think young people say it's just like this Oxford Union, right? The Oxford Union, you bring these people in, they debate, they yell and scream at one another, and then what do you do? That's why you put a bar in the lounge, right? Because then you all get together and kind of hang out. That's the way, that's the way it, I'm gonna say it used to work that way. There have been times in American history where it didn't work very well, people screaming and yelling at one another, but things work better when people can know each other, get along and try to find some common ground. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Sam at St. Hilda's, who says, do you not worry that when centre-right figures like yourself insert yourselves into left-wing discourse, young progressives are left with no chance of holding real political power, and hence we see things like protests and people taking to the streets, because they're right. not able to exert political power through the normal channels? Well, let, 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 me, let me, because I, this keeps coming up. I don't want to cast aspersions on people who think differently or have more ideas that are, you know, that, that we can define as radical on either the right or the left. Uh, I'm not casting aspersions. They, and we need to think about new ideas, new ways of doing things. So, I mean, 
I'm just trying to suggest that if you if you if you want to pass some things, people people most of the time want to see something that's more moderate. Uh, I think one of the things that happened with the with the virus, uh, with the pandemic, is it's made people nervous and more reluctant to change things. But no, I, I think that the ideas that they have, you know, Medicare for all, that's because, you know, healthcare costs too much. People live on the edge. Sometimes their healthcare bills is as much as the as what it costs to uh, to, to pay off the mortgage on their home. I mean, these these it is good that they're raising these issues, the issues of race. You listen to those ideas and then maybe you you nub them down a little bit. But I'm not here to tell you that if you're a progressive and you have that you don't matter. Of course you matter. Of course you should count. Uh, I'm just trying to suggest that at this point in time, with some of those ideas, they made people nervous and people want to know why was the election so close? And I'm just trying to tell you, but I am not saying in any way, shape or form, if you happen to be a young progressive, you ought to just be quiet. Absolutely not. And, you know, I don't view protests as bad either. I think protesting with, you know, minus the violence, that's America. That's, that's the way we function here because change comes from the bottom up. And so I give a lot of credit to those who have been, uh, you know, more, uh, more extreme on the environment because be, being that way has moved the issue to, to have to be considered. You can't deny it. Well, some do, but you can't really deny it anymore. So I, I just really think that I don't want you to be discouraged or think your ideas aren't going to happen because in the 21st century, throughout history, we have to consider new ways of thinking and doing things. All right, thank you very much. The next question is about the US electoral system. It's from Justin Oriel. He says, how do we restore trust in the US electoral system? Citing, for instance, um, post-election surveys that show two thirds of Republicans believing the US electoral system shouldn't be trusted going forwards. Do you worry that that, tr that lack of trust, excuse me, will lead to a downturn in Republican participation in future elections? And if so, how can we prevent that? Well, I. I, it's one of the reasons, again, why I didn't support Donald Trump. This notion that, you know, that this is all fraud and vote for mail is fraud. It's a, that's a joke. It's not true. But <clears throat> if you create a sense in our country that you can't trust these elections, you're creating a, a crisis. And so I was with a guy on Sunday. We were playing golf. Uh, and He's a young guy. He says, well, how do we know? How do we know? I said, well, we count them. We send a board of elections. They get certified and all that. If you don't like it, you can challenge the vote count. You can go to, you can go to court. I mean, I looked at him and, he's, and so he, we got done. He said, you know that I believe what you're saying. I said, listen, what I'm telling you is once these things get decided and you go someplace and hanging out with somebody and they say, well, this was all fraud, you have to speak out. You have to say, no, that's, that's just simply not true. In terms of turnout for elections, everybody worries about turnout. I never worried about turnout, and I'd like to see more young people vote, but the reason I don't worry about turnout is people turn out and vote in elections that has a consequence for them or an impact on them or relevancy to them. And um, that's why people turned out here. They had very strong opinions. So, you know, you have an election where you got, you know, Tweedledum or Tweedledee, and nobody, I mean, people just don't care, but well, things that are that are really important to them, they'll turn out and vote, believe me. But that lack of trust in vote by mail, for instance, how do you think that that will affect future elections, especially when we're looking at Republicans already suffering because of Democrats? They'll all start voting by mail. They'll start voting by mail. Ohio's had voting by mail, I think, for 20 years, mm -hmm. with virtually no fraud and no trouble whatsoever. So it's going to change. And you know, one of the things that's happened, I read today, and I, I just have to read all the time and absorb all this. And it, it's really a challenge. <laughs> but these people who live not in the suburbs, but farther out from the city and they have to commute great distances, they love the vote for mail. It makes it easier for them to participate because they've got so many challenges when it comes to getting to work and, and doing the things they want to do. Thank you. <clears throat> it's here to stay, B. We're not doing away with vote for mail. Thank you. Oh, Next no, no. is from Dr. Laura Smithson Ants, who says exit polls showed voters disassociating economic distress from COVID. How do you think that this will affect turning policies attempting to deal with the economy and healthcare into law? Well, first of all, 
I don't, these exit polls are, I'm not so sure how, yeah. how, how great they are, but look, it's going to be a dance. First of all, we know what, uh, what your prime minister is doing um, uh, with a lockdown. I don't think we would see that in the United States. I think we'd see sort of what we would call a dance that in areas that have that spark spike up real high, uh, you're going to have things done there where people pr pr uh, fundamentally governors, mayors or whatever will try to control that. But an overall lockdown, I don't see it. It's, it's called it's a, it, it's really called a dance that you do with the virus. At the same time, you know, the economy is really is really critical. Uh, and, and by the way, allowing people to be able to get out and, and be responsible, wear a mask, social distance and all that. You just don't want to lock people down because then you create problems with uh, with depression, you, drug problems, uh, abuse, all kinds of things. So it's a dance and I don't know how you're going to handle it in Great Britain, but I'm sure Boris is spending a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, but so it's a, you want to get keep the economy going as best you can and at the same time deal with the virus. So it's it's, it's a real challenge. Now, you know, of course, we had very good news about Pfizer and the fact that this was 90% effective. The concern that some have is that's really great news, but as this virus uh, mutates, will that, will that vaccine be as effective? That's why I'm also hoping uh, for therapeutics, you know, uh, so that we can be treated. If we get this disease, that we can be treated. So the vaccine combined with therapeutics will allow us to essentially go a long way towards return to normalcy, which will also help us with our economic growth. On the topic of the pandemic then, when you see something like the politicization of mask wearing and the serious culture wars that have emerged in the US on the basis of that, much more so than here, how do you see the country coming back from that, this politicization of public health? Does it worry you? What do you think the well, future- I think, I think the people that many of whom uh, don't wear a mask, have some bis misguided notion that this is, uh, that, you know, this is about personal freedom. The only problem with that is your freedom only extends to somebody else's freedom. So if you're going around spreading the virus, you know, that's just, that's a disaster and it's dead wrong. So, you know, but there's no surprise in a time when there's so much disruption and, uh, and a leader who will just basically say anything and not be a good role model uh, these things come up. So I'm a Republican or I'm a conservative and I don't even believe we have a pandemic, you know, and all. God bless them. Okay. Good for you, but don't affect, infect me or my friends or anybody else in the community. And can we just have some common sense? I mean, come on, you're sick. If you sneeze, you cover your nose. If you cough, you cover your mouth. I mean, what, what it's, this is, it's just sort of degenerated into a theater of the absurd. But on a political level, how do you deal with that? How do you create that common sense, install that common sense in people? You know, it's, it's an art more than it is a science. So I won a very close election my first time. I went through this disastrous uh, referendum where I got slaughtered on it, but I learned from it. And I learned that you can never leave anybody behind. I mean, that's, that is really critical to being a, a really good public servant. If you do something for people who have, you need to do something for people uh, who are the have nots. You need to, you, you know, if you want to be a successful leader, in my opinion, be, I got to walk in your shoes a little bit. I mean, I've got to slow my life down. And I wrote a book, it's called, It's Up to Us. Uh, and it talks about 10 little things we can do to bring about change, that all of us matter, that we can drive change from the bottom up, that we need to slow down our lives, that we need to be in a position of where we put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. And um, I've been fortunate. I grew up in a very, you know, in a Democrat family in a town where if the wind blew the wrong way, people were out of work. So the sense of fairness and compassion, I, I thank the Lord for, and I thank uh, where I grew up, my background. So it's always been a sense of, I give you an example. When I was, right before I was even sworn into office, a group of ladies from Appalachia came to see me and they had pictures of all their sons and daughters who had died from opiates. And we had what was called pill mills in that part of the state. I said, well, why do we have them there? Well, nobody ever did anything about them. Well, we shut them down. 
and the attorney general prosecuted the people who were involved in passing out pills like, like they were passing out candy. That sent a message to people there, but that's fairness. You know, it, that's a matter when I cut taxes for those at the top, I, I provided tax relief for those at the bottom, you know, that expanding Medicaid so that we didn't have people, you know, being in jail or sleeping under a bridge who had, who had, Ill, had mental illness or, you know, I mean, it's like providing insurance for, for mothers and fathers who have kids who were, uh, who were autistic. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's about a heart. It's about what you do when you look at, I've been involved in areas where there was great poverty and what we could do to get the community to pull together, to lift themselves up and protect their children. It, 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 it's just, it's a sense of head and heart. That's what I think Biden is. I think he has that kind of a heart along with the brain to get that done. But, you know, when, when you think about those who we admire and are most successful, they're the ones that have, that they get us, that understand us. And is there a, a definite science? I don't think so. Because a lot of it is about the head and the heart and the way you pre present yourself and the things you do to relieve the, the challenges and problems that people have. Does that make sense? I mean, my dad carried mail on his back. I know what these working people think. I know why these people are frustrated and Trump appealed to them because they kind of felt like, I don't matter. It's all these elites on the West Coast and the East Coast and they get what they want and they talk down to me and they don't respect me and I'm playing by the rules and I'm not getting anywhere. I get that. I understand it. But you have to give them a plan where they can have hope. I wrote a book called Two Paths, which was a, it described my campaign for president and why I wasn't for Trump. You, you know, when you know the people are in trouble, you can go two ways in life. You can tell them, you can climb in, into their shoes and say, look, I got it. I understand it. It can be better. Or you can climb into their shoes and say to them, the reason you don't have something is because somebody took it from you. And that's called demagoguery. And there's no place for that, B. Demagogues, I have no time, have no time for that. Because all it does is divide us and give us false impressions about things. Right. Boy, you got me, whoever that was, got me worked up on that. But I wanted Thank to say it. So no, final. I'll just say one other thing now that I have all, of, maybe all of your attention, if you haven't turned off. Please do. One of the big things that has helped me in my life is faith in a higher power, faith in God. And I'll tell you why I, why I say that. There's two great commandments. One is, one is love God, which is don't love yourself so much, humility. And the other one is love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. I believe that religion is, should be more about the do's and not the don'ts. The don'ts of you know, don't do this and don't do that, but the do's about how we can, we can have more courage to do the right thing and not worry so much about the yelling and the screaming that comes from people that oppose us. And this has given me a great sense of serenity and allows me to be, do you have any idea what it was like when I decided to go speak at the Democrat convention as a Republican? But I'm, I'm cool with it because I feel good about myself and I have a higher power I answer to than somebody out here is going to scream that you know, it holds a, you know, some kind of partisan label or whatever. I'm sorry. Got to, I wanted you all to hear that. No, thank you know, one you. last thing I want to say yeah. to all of you that are under these high, in this high stress Look, in our, in our country, we have a, a really a serious issue uh, with suicide. There's a lot of pressure. Uh, and when you are at a place like Oxford and you're supposed to do you know, this or that or whatever, and you feel these pressures, if you have them, you got to find somebody to talk to. And there is no weakness in doing that. There's great strength in being able to we admit a weakness, you know, and there's great weakness in just thinking I have strength. So for those that struggle, please get help and don't be embarrassed. All right, right. next question. Thank you very much. We'll do one final question then in that case. That's it? It is, we're finished at about 10 to. Um, so on that note, um, as the Republican party moves into a post-Trump era, what is next for you and what do you see your role as? Um, well, I've, I've said that I would I would help the Biden administration in some ways. You know, if they wanted to form some kind of an advisory council to figure out where we go on these issues and pull people together, I'd, I'd be delighted to help them on that. If there was a crisis somewhere in the world, 
and perhaps I could go and, and mediate that, I would be more than willing to do it. But I like my life. You know, I, I have this um, career in the media. I built my own company, which I'm having a great time with, uh, with my uh, partner uh, in, uh, in business, Beth Hansen, and uh, having a great time. And what we do is we bring a public purpose to a public company. We think that's really, really important. And then I have a chance to do things like this. And I so appreciate uh, you folks giving me a chance to, to be with you today. The Oxford Union is really remarkable. And who knows, B, I'm hoping you are going to be prime minister someday. On that note, I think we'll end it there. Thank you for <laughs> joining us, John Kasich. It has been a great honor to speak to you. And thank you to so, thank you so much, excuse me, to everybody who watched and participated. Thank you very much. And God bless everybody. Thank you. We'll get there. Unity. Thanks.